Welcome to the Fish Nerds Podcast. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, and I'm sitting here with Nick. Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Now, Nick uh, Hudson Squagger is uh, one of our correspondents, and he is also our audio producer, so it's fun to have you on the show. It is. I hope my audio is okay. Yeah, and this week's show, I'm probably mixing myself, so <laughs> <laughs> you can't take credit for it, because I won't get to it about three this morning. Okay. That's the way it is. But uh, we're actually recording outside right now. We're sitting uh, on Peak Pocket Pond, hoping to catch some pond pout. Pond pout. Pond pout. Pond pout. Pond pout. Pond pout. So the old New Hampshire guys call them. Okay. So we're just sitting here. We got our, our summer shandies. We're smoking cigars to keep the bugs away. It is a beautiful evening. It's like 85 degrees. I know. <laughs> Stupid hot. Feels like the Midwest. It does, I and mean, hopefully we'll uh, we'll see a fish here soon. Or maybe we'll catch one live while we're recording. That would be awesome. Yeah, but a this excitement. yeah, but this week's show. Uh, first of all, I want to before we get into this week's show, we're gonna actually we're gonna get into it. This week's show, it's gonna be killing fish in time with Hugo. Hugo's gonna cook something strange for us. I'm thinking sea robin. Sea robin, what's that? Sea robin is it's like a sculpin type ocean fish. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Trash fish. So, trash fish. You know, Hugo's big on that. And then we're going to have Andrew Lewin from Speak Up for the Blue. He has a podcast out of Toronto. It's an ocean conservation podcast. And he's a correspondent for us as well. Right. Uh, but I talked, I came on his show two weeks ago and recorded an interview, and it came out good. And I thought I'd just uh, put it out there. That's moving because I'm bumping into it. Yeah, yeah. I thought we were going to have excitement. You know, that would be great. But yeah, the best way to catch a catfish is to forget you're fishing and, <laughs> and drink beer and talk. There you go. So that's the plan. Uh, but before we get to that, um, I want to talk a little bit about safety and why you should always wear a PFD while fishing. Oh, you're going to put me on the spot here? Yes. And so I, I, I follow along. And if you're not already on the Fish Nerds uh, Facebook group, it's a podcast group on, on Facebook, you miss out on the fun little adventures. And Nick's always posting his fishing stories on there. And Nick... Went out fishing alone on his kayak one morning on a pond uh, in the middle of nowhere. I did, and, yes. And you went bass fishing. I did. I How'd was, it go? Um, well, I didn't catch any bass. And I uh, did catch some pickerel. Excellent. There's tons of pickerel in that pond. Excellent. Absolutely masses. But uh, yeah, so I was on my way back, and I wasn't really paying attention. And I went to grab something on the kayak and just tipped it over now the ironic part of this and you're gonna get a kick out of this okay because i love irony yes so the the previous night i was watching some fishing blooper videos on youtube and you're laughing at people and i'm laughing out. at yep. people tipping their kayaks going how does anybody do that it's impossible it's <laughs> impossible why you know and then i as i was heading out i was like you know it'll be just my luck i'm a if I tip my kayak and sure enough I did and everything went overboard and I was luckily wearing my life vest which I always do smart I don't always yes I'm a bad example um I also always tell somebody it's just like hiking I tell somebody where I'm going to be when I expect to be off the water uh, for the for this exact reason so uh yeah I had to search for my rods and uh I lost a rod and yeah went back and snorkel for it and didn't find it it's so hard to find things when you're snorkeling in those lakes it really is it's it's mucky and it had rained and there was no chance but i did recover two of my rods at the time which was good that's pretty good and you didn't lose your cell phone or anything like that no i had my cell phone in a waterproof case in a zipper pocket in my pdf so pfd pfd yes yeah, pdf it's a document that's right yeah it's a I, different... I mix them up there, sometimes one of them will float you someplace and yep. one won't yes <laughs> So, if you try floating with a PDF, you're yeah. just not going anywhere. So the moral is always wear your, your life jacket um, or some sort of flotation. I want to get one of those like inflatable belts or something. Yeah. Because I don't like wearing a big poofy life jacket. I, You know, it's a little bit of a pain, but I just feel so much more secure. And after this experience, I will never go without it. Yeah, and it's smart, especially alone like that. You never know. And we, and we've in, in our area, we've actually lost a few people recently on the rivers here not wearing life jackets. So it's yes. really important and critical you do it. And uh, yes, they, ha they, they sell really good ones now, too, that look good and are comfortable. So you can always yeah. buy a nice one. Well, I got mine at that at that outfitter place that's going out of business. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you could get a good deal there if you need one. I'll, I'll do that tomorrow. Okay. It's on my list. So anyway, so anyway, we're, we're here... 
We're fishing. Um, this episode tonight is brought to you by Patreon.com. That's you guys, our listeners. So if you want to support the show, go to Patreon.com forward slash Fish Nerds and donate to the show. Most people give a dollar an episode, $4 a month, and that goes a long way to keeping the show going. Right now, we're getting about $300 a month, which is fantastic, and that barely covers the production cost of this show. All the internet stuff we do and the Facebooky things and the buying the equipment and but it doesn't cover time or travel or any other expenses. So we, we need, need money to keep this show on the road, and uh, it's important. Yeah, and, you know, as somebody who is now involved in the production, you know, the amount of time and effort work that goes into producing the show is actually quite impressive. So it, the money really does does go somewhere important. Right, we got to pad your pockets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to get paid. Yeah, you know, but we had to, the Patreon paid for the equipment. We're outside recording outside, and it sounds good because of Patreon, because of you guys. If you donate at the twenty-five dollar an episode level, which is pretty high bar, we'll mention your business on the show. So we have right now, uh, Josh Lopes has donated twenty-five dollars per episode. He's LopesTax dot com. So if you're in Massachusetts and you need a fancy pants accountant, he's your guy. Go to LopesTax dot com. Uh, and, and he's actually a really good guy. He's my neighbor, and I've been fishing with him as well. So. Is he good at fishing? No, he sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but his kids are great, and, and that's that's what counts. So anyway, patreon.com forward slash the fish nerds. Help us support this show. And now we're going to kick this ball down to Hugo with Killing Fish in Time with Hugo. Hey folks, Hugo Madero's here with some more adventures in cooking seafood on the behalf of the fish nerds. So we're into uh, late spring here in Massachusetts and New England and the U.S. Having a great time, finally. It was a slow winter here. Didn't get uh, many chances to ice fish just because of the weather or to open water fish. So finally spring has come and I've been going out as much as I can, every chance I can, and having a blast. So this one is cool. This is a great fish, great creature. Um, and it's uh, not only cool looking, underutilized, it's also, well, you know me, it's awesome to eat. So this is about the uh, sea robins. So these creatures, if you guys haven't seen them, Google it. They're, uh, they're so cool looking. Um, they're, they're very abundant. You catch them as you're trying to catch, you know, uh, game species like stripers or black sea bass and other species. Um, they're, they're fun to catch. A lot of people hate catching them because they are everywhere. And they're usually pretty small and they're tough to clean. But if you do it, they have, um... Two strips of meat kind of along the tail, you know, from the back of the head all the way back down, one on each side. Uh, when you cut them out, you get these two little, uh, these two little like tenderloins of, uh, of white fish and they are delicious. Uh, the other thing that um, someone turned me on to last year um, is their, uh, their fish roe, the eggs that they have. So I love eggs of all sorts and have eaten eggs from all sorts of fish as far as I can remember. So I tried these ones last year. Um, you got to be careful to get them out. They, um, you know, it's in it's a row sack and you have to be careful when you're gutting them to uh, get it out carefully. But once you do and once you've cooked them, I love them. They're very mild flavor, kind of sweet, nutty almost flavor. And they're... Uh, they're just delicious. I just ate um, a bunch of them. I ate probably three, four meals with uh, with these. So this one's wicked cool. Uh, what I did with this one is I took a cupcake can, uh, pan, and in each of the holes where you would make the cupcakes, I lined the walls with uh, bacon. And then after that, I would take one row sack and put it inside in the middle, and then I cracked an egg and put it in there and seasoned it, of course, with a little bit of salt and pepper. So those went in the oven for a while. Um, you know, I was curious to see how this came out. I don't know what made me think of it, but I got those guys out and I tried it and it is delicious. What I ended up doing uh, after my first or second one 
is uh, I topped it with um, Sambalulek, which is this, uh, it's in, you'll see it in the Asian sections of the American grocery stores. It's this uh, crushed red peppers and a little red uh, clear jar with the green top. So I put that, fresh cut scallions, and just the mix of flavors of all that and the textures with the egg and the bacon and the roast sack is awesome. So I'm gonna push, uh, post the, um, we'll post the recipe up on fishnerds.com. Check it out. Uh, you know, I'd love to eat all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it might sound a little bit crazy. It's not weird tasting at all. It was delicious. So I can't wait to get out there and get some more of these little guys. Have fun, everybody. Later. Okay, fish nerds, one more thing you should know. We started last week a process of a process, <laughs> a program where we're reporting on your local fishing conditions. And we got a few phone calls in. If you want to be part of it, call 607 378 Fish and leave your fishing report. At the end of every episode after the credits, you will hear fishing reports. The hope is to get people from around the world calling in every week with their reports. And you can mention your business or whatever. If you're a guide, you can mention that, or your website, whatever you want. And you can be as creative as you want. So just call us in, 607-378-FISH. Leave us your name, your location, because that matters. Yes, it does. Uh, and what's the fishing like in your area? And don't make stuff up. Just tell us what, what's going on. So so should I report my flipping thing as well? or You know, you could. You could say, you know, the yeah. water is very wet in Maine today, so yeah. uh, where are your PFDs? Oh, and we're back. And after hearing Hugo cooking all that food, it makes me want to cook food. When's the last time you've had fresh seafood? Uh, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. I think uh, actually when we went ice fishing was the last time I had fresh food. That's fresh too bad. Fish, yeah. Now, you missed out last night. I invited you over to my house. You did. So let me tell you what we had last night. I invited uh, the small ones over. Yep. And so I was out fishing earlier this week with Captain Sean, which we're going to talk right. about in one second. Yeah. Um, and we caught a bunch of pollock and haddock and Acadia redfish. So last night at my house, I had a fish fry. But I also had this project we're working on called Eating with the Ecosystem, where I need to eat sustainable seafood every week, and they give me a list of fish to catch, or to, not catch, to get the store. Mm -hmm. And one of the fish on my list this week was not a fish, it was lobster. Oh. So you missed out last night. We had fresh haddock, fresh pollock, and lobster. I really did mess Last up. night at my house, uh, and we feasted. It was fabulous. And this time of year, lobster is not, they're about to molt. Yeah. So they're full of meat. They're not all hollowed out. Oh, okay. They are stacked. So anyway, we had that last night. Next week on the show, we're going to have the folks from Eating with the Ecosystem on the show, and they're going to talk about sustainable uh, seafood projects, a citizen science project they're working on, and how people can participate and be part of of eating sustainably seafood. Um, That'll be exciting. That's yeah. a that's a really interesting project. It is, and I understand a lot about, but I, I'm still questioning what they consider sustainable. So I have some questions. For example, also on my list is cod. Okay. Now, cod, has, there's a moratorium on cod fishing in Maine right now. Right. So how can that be on my sustainable seafood list? Is it sustainable other places? Yeah, like Alaska. Ah. And so, but they're supposed to be about local. So I'm going to have a lot of questions about it. They may clarify or they may, maybe they'll agree with me. I don't know. Interesting. So I'm hoping to hear what they have to say. So that'll be fun. Also next week on the show, last week I went fishing with Captain Sean from MainTunaFishing.com. Yeah. I brought the recording equipment on the boat with me and I recorded some audio. Uh, so next week. We'll be splicing that together and talking about fishing at MainTunaFishing.com with Captain Sean Tibbetts. The reason I'm bringing it up now, though, is we're offering a contest right now. We're giving away a fishing trip for two on the Miss Megan 2. That's MainTunaFishing.com's boat. And that's ground fishing. That means 25 miles out to uh, Jeffrey's Ledge to catch Pollock and Haddock and Wow, that's an amazing fish. opportunity. Yeah, it's like an $800 value. And the way you get in on that contest, you go to our Facebook page, and, and you find, on, at the top of it, you'll find a contest link. You click through, enter a quick survey, and you're entered. You can enter once that way. But you can enter two more times by giving $10, by throwing $10 in the hat. Oh, and here's okay. the trick. Now, a lot of people are going, Clay, what's that $10 for? Are you giving it to charity? And the answer is no, I'm not giving it to charity. 
The ten dollars no. goes to pay for the trip. The trip costs a lot of money. The gas to get to, out there is not free. Captain Sean is not a big o- operation. I'm not a big operation, and these things cost money. So we're trying to break even on this trip. We're just giving it away. Uh huh. So we're hoping that people are like, yes, I want to be on the trip, and I don't mind throwing ten dollars in on that to to hopefully win a trip that's worth eight hundred bucks. Yeah, that that's so, amazing that he's willing to do that. Yeah, we did it two years ago. And go. we caught a uh, six and a half foot mako shark that was like two hundred and ten pound fish. Oh, was that the mako shark that you considered eating this year? That I'm not going to eat again. But yeah. we <laughs> ate it that time, and I, I learned that we shouldn't do that. But anyway, it's uh, but that went well. So this is a this is a ground fishing trip where we're targeting sustainable fish. Uh, now Captain Sean is uh, he gets a little anxious and and he acts out like a child, and that's okay. And he's a lot of fun. So next week on the show, you're going to hear a bit of that. Um, next week's show is not for people who don't like bad language, uh, because it will be rated our show. Oh, um, man. Yeah, I apologize in advance. You can try and beep them, but I think you'll give up on it pretty quick. No point. Just put a disclaimer in front just, of it. Well, here it is. Yep. So anyway, that's next week. Go to the Fish Nerds Facebook group to find that contest, um, or you can go to the MainTuneFishing.com's Facebook page, and you'll find that contest. Click through. Uh, if you click the yes button, you're willing to throw $10 in the hat. I'll invoice you. You give us 10 bucks. And that helps cover the cost of the show. So it seems selfish and self-serving, but it, it is. But these things cost money. And again, yeah. we're not, I'm not Walmart. I'm no. the fish nerds. So you are. I are fish nerds. Arr. 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 All right. Hey, speaking of nerds, we have Speak Up for Blue um, as a partner of ours. Um, they have a podcast out of Toronto, but they reach the world. And Andrew Lewin is an ocean scientist. And he makes his podcast called Speak Up for Blue. And I went on his show and recorded this great interview with him. I think he was fantastic. He really asked all the right questions. And so here is Speak Up for Blue with Andrew Lewin. And we encourage you to go over and to your iTunes or wherever you get in your podcast and subscribe to his show. Hey, Clay. Welcome to Speak Up for Blue podcast. Are you ready to dive in and talk about some ocean conservation? I'm always ready to talk about ocean conservation, even when I'm killing things in the ocean. (laughs) (laughs) What a great way to start the episode. A wonderful way to talk about that. Yeah, We got Clay on. He kills things in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, And welcome to the show. Hey, yeah. Hi. (laughs) I am death. (laughs) Welcome to my nightmare. (laughs) This is what the show is going to be like the way through, folks. We get along really, really well. Uh, Clay, you and I have known each other for about a year, but it feels like we've known each other forever. Um, I've been on your podcast because you do have a podcast called The Fish Nerds, mm-hmm. which I, uh, I've i been happy to contribute to at, from time to time. Uh, and I look forward to contributing more. Um, but Does that uh, make you my employee? Yeah, my oh. unpaid are you I'm doing paid. fellowship? Your intern? Yeah, my intern? intern. Yeah, I'm correspondent. Yeah, I, I, I get your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> if our show ever makes money, I'm gonna uh, someday I plan on paying correspondents. <laughs> yeah, right right correspondents. now, right now I pay you with like kindness. <laughs> hey, you pay me? No, you pay me with with listeners, man. Yeah. We cross we cross our audience yeah, uh, audience sure. and, and that's thing and that's that's the greatest thing about about podcasting, right? Is 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 that cross pollination type type work. Um, but we, we're going to talk about some sustainable seafood today. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what, and I'm excited because this is something that I've been, uh, you know, I've been talking about throughout, you know, since we started the podcast two years ago and, you know, we've been training it is to figure out what's sustainable, what's not. Now there are apps and everything like that, but the people that we buy food from don't always follow the apps or uh, don't really know what it's about. Cause I go to the grocery store and I say, Hey, Hey, where is this fish from and how was it caught? And the 15 year old that's getting paid minimum wage who can barely speak because he's so shy, you know, is saying, I don't know, like, I have no idea. Then I'm like, well, I can't buy from here because, you know, I don't know where it's coming from. And he's like, I don't care. I'm just here for the money. Right. And it's just so and he thinks it's a, you're it's a, a dick a because question. you're hassling him, right? So you're like, why are you hassling <laughs> yeah. me? I'm just Yeah, why are you asking me kid? all these questions? I just I, I scraped the bottom of the fish bin at the end of the day. <laughs> what am I supposed to know stuff? It's crazy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we're gonna talk all about that kind of stuff. You know, uh, you know, how you look for seafood because uh, you, you know, I've listened to one and we're gonna talk about one of your recent podcasts where you, you presented at the Virginia Aquarium, uh, uh, where you recorded that for your podcast. Um but uh, it was really interesting to to hear how you know you look for food, you look for for specific fish, uh, that 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 journey, and then to cook it, and then now you're into sustainable seafood and how you get into that and how we can really 
uh, get into that for different types of fish and, and whatnot. Uh, but first, uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself for people who haven't listened to the Fish Nerds podcast. By the way, we're going to be putting the links uh, to the show notes. It's going to be speakupforblue.com forward slash fish nerds. Um, but there's, you, if you're on your podcast app, just go to Fish Nerds. But we'll put the links in the show notes. Uh, but just to let everybody know who you are, what you do, all that kind of jazz. Oh, sure. Uh, so my name is Clay. I am the chief executive fish nerd of the Fish Nerds Ooh, podcast, like, right? Like that, just like yeah. you're an oceanpreneur. I'm a fish nerdpreneur. <laughs> right. I'm only <laughs> just like you. Neither one of us make any real money at this uh, yet, but it's coming. Uh, it's but but I've been making the Fish Nerds podcast for, gosh, three years now. Um, been through uh, co-hosts and many, many correspondents over that time. Uh, but we make a show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. And we always say anything is fair game, um, which is a nice broad spectrum because fish is everything. And I'll tell you one thing I love about fish. Well, there's mm -hmm. a couple. There's a lot of things because fish are, are, are amazing. But the thing I like about fish is it's every culture is impacted by fish. No matter where you live on the planet, you live in a place where fish are nearby. And the reason your town is where it's at or your village is where it's at is because fish were there. And yeah. it's that kind of one thing we can all talk about that all matters to all of us, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we love that. And it's like kind of like everyone has something to talk about with fish. Um, and the podcast came from, originally I went on a quest to catch and eat every kind of freshwater fish in New Hampshire. Uh, part of that was just to do something no one's done before. But the other part of it was to bring awareness to uh, non-game species of fish that no one cares and knows about. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take credit in New Hampshire. We have a fish called a fall fish. It's New Hampshire's largest native minnow, and they get about three pounds, right? Okay. Imagine like a, like imagine like a, a, you know, a shiny little carp like a thing. Yeah. Um, and I, I will argue that uh, before I went on this quest, no one knew the name of the fall fish unless they were a biologist or worked in the industry. Uh, everyone online, all the Facebook groups and all that called them chubs and uh, river dace and all kinds of weird, not quite names of fish. Those are all like generic things. They didn't care. Well, mi first of all, minnows very different. Minnows are very difficult to identify. In the first, they place, are right? very difficult. But but fall fish in New Hampshire pretty easy because they're they're kind of okay. a unique thing for the state. Um, I've, I'll I can share some links later. But the um the cool thing is is. I've been pushing the name fall fish, fall fish, fall fish for years. Uh, and now you go on those same groups online, all the big online forums, and people are talking about the fish they caught. And they're getting every other fish wrong still, but they're getting fall fish right. Uh, that's because of me. Huh. Yeah, I'm going to own that. Go. It's probably not just me. I know, but it, uh, <laughs> I'll take some credit. But uh, it, we went out, we caught and ate them all. And the reason we ate them all was, was again, not when you're doing something, especially doing it publicly, you have to do it bigger and you know, I always tell my kids, when you do something good, do it one gooder, right? Well, to right, make it right, one right. gooder, that's my science talk. It means to make better. I love it. Um, we, to make it one better, we ate them all because, again, everyone eats, right? And turns out most people would prefer to talk about eating the fish than any other part of the quest. They want to know what's the worst tasting, best tasting, weirdest, funniest, did you die? How's your mercury levels this year? That I love all that kind of conversation. It's really great. Um, and it really helps us a lot to have that conversation and it makes it funnier. Uh, and I also have a science teacher background. I've been a science teacher for years. Um, I'm a trained trainer of science teachers. Uh, and so communicating science is part of what mm -hmm. I do as well. Uh, we were yep. talking about the, uh, the pre-show. And so I love to dive into a lot of the science topics that people maybe don't understand. Um, yeah. And here's the funniest thing is I am wrong more than I'm right. And I and it's true. <laughs> I it. And I take a lot of flack for that. A lot of, because um, I'm also a fishing guide. Fishing guides uh, live in a world of egos, right? Where they're right. right all the time. I've got a patch on. I have a, somewhere I've got... I thought I had some guide patches I would show you, but I've got a guide patch and that says I know stuff. Um, right, right. But I've got a science teaching background, which means I love to be wrong and I love to learn from that. So I post pictures of fish online sometimes. I get them wrong. And then I get phone calls from guides saying, uh, Clay, you might want to take that post down because uh, you called a brown trout a salmon and I know you went to guide school and blue, 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 blue. And what happened, the reality is what happens is I post a pic picture of a fish up and I get it wrong. And someone says, wow, Clay, that's a salmon. And I go, ha, huh, you're right. I made the classic <laughs> mistake of judging a fish by its color and not by its mm -hmm. fin structure right. or whatever it happened to be. And rather than take, take it down and pretend I know stuff, I went, you're right. I was wrong. Thanks for showing me. Um, which is a different attitude than probably most other 
know it all podcasts have, I hope. Yeah. Um, but mostly the most important thing about the Fish Nerds podcast is it's nerdy and it's fun. And fun. if I'm not having fun, I'm out of here. Um, yeah. Because we do this same as you. We do this for almost free. Um, we got some Patreon subscribers. I know you've got some Patreon people yep. as well. Give us a little bit of money here and there. That helps, but it doesn't put money in the bank. It doesn't put right. gas in the car. It doesn't pay right. our travel expenses. It barely buys my wife dinner, um, which right. is an important part of also what I do. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah. so anyway, Fish Nerds Podcast, fishnerds.com for all your fish nerds needs. Perfect. Um, Perfect. It's fun. You know, mostly it's fun. And you're a contributor to our show. You work with us now, which is great. I am. I, I, I love it. I'll tell you uh, my first, and I, I've said I've said it here before on the show, but I'm going to say it again because you're here. When, the, before I went on your show, uh, and it's the reason actually why I started the Facebook group for Speak Up for Blue is because you have probably one of the most engaging groups on Facebook that I've ever been a part That's of. That's the Fish Nerds podcast group you can join today. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Just look it up. I'll, again, we'll put the links yeah, to that easy. because it is a great group. Um, but it's it's one of those, you know, I, you you were prepping for the show. Uh, we, I think it was like a week until we went on, until we were going to record and you put in, it was right after we talked, you said, Hey, I'm going to have uh, Andrew Lewin, who is an ocean conservationist. He is a scientist. You know, what questions would you like to ask? And I, and at first I was like, Oh, this is kind of cool. We'll see like maybe one or two questions. And it just went, oh, <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. How I, many questions there I were. I could do a day. daily show on just the stuff people post in our Facebook group. Oh yeah. I, I would never run out of material. The, the guy, nope. people in that group, I say guys, but it's guys and girls. The guys people girls, yep. in that group, um, are constantly asking questions, constantly challenging my assumptions. But it, the nice thing yeah. about it is it's, if you go to a lot of other fishing groups, if you're a fisherman, you'll find on those other fishing groups, um, people are mean. And right. in, in our group, people are listening. And yeah, they're absolutely. disagreeing like crazy. There's plenty of disagreement. Yeah. There's a debate going on, but yeah. it's, it's it's respectful. Yeah, they like each right. other. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know it's true. And 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 when I when I went in to answer the questions, like, and then I was getting replies like within minutes, and I was just like, wow, these guys are these guys and girls are really into it, and and it made for I think a better show for you and I mm -hmm. because we were both prepped on what you know what your listeners wanted to hear, yep. and then we, we started talking. And to be honest, since then. They still ask me questions and I still stay in the group and oh, I they still tag you now, right now. Like, Hey, Andrew, yeah, what about this? What about this? What about yeah. this? Yeah. And it's great because in the segments that I contribute to your show, I'm like, tag me in if you have a question, cause I want to answer. Cause some of these, you know, sometimes when you, when you do science communication, I'm sure you felt the same way is you, you touch upon the overview stuff, mm -hmm. right? The high level stuff that people, not everybody understands or not everybody really knows, but you're saying it over and over and over again. I find the people in Fishners and people on speak up for blue, want to go that one level deeper. Yep. And, and the, the questions that like the, one of the questions that I answered on both shows was, you know, are the gray seals in Cape Cod affecting the recovery of cod? That was a great question. And mm -hmm. it's a, it's a great, it's a great, it's fun to get into those kinds of answers because they're real issues. Yeah. And, if, I mean, and, and they're interesting and that, having yeah. that real life connection. Is nice. The interesting thing about both those groups, we're going to just pat each other on the back all night here, but the, um, <laughs> The the groups have have crossed over a lot too because I'm spending time in your group and I'm seeing yeah. people in your group who have been in into my show for years, yeah, and I'm seeing them bleed into your group and they oh, should. Yeah. Um, both groups are valuable. Both groups have great conversation. You should join our groups and then ditch everyone else. Screw them, absolutely, because they suck. I agree, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Like like it's funny because like both of us will get like material from one of the groups and then we'll go to the next group and cover the same stuff because we're like hey did you guys hear this like this is what we're covering yeah but it, it 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 sparks conversation and when you have people who are ready to do the conversation it's great and the reason why i'm really talking about this because you guys should join both groups the fish nerds group as well as speak up for blue community because it's fun it's fun to get into it and to talk and to debate and to go and see everybody's viewpoints and everybody's respectful because I don't like any kind of disrespect in my, in my group, but everybody's great so far. So it's been, it's been wonderful. Um, but what, like, I got to ask you the question in terms of a podcast itself. Um, the, you know, the outdoor podcasts mm -hmm. is, are pretty competitive in they, terms of yeah. uh, listeners. You do pretty well. We've, we've shared our numbers. Mm -hmm. You, you do pretty well. Yeah, I would say I'm, um, in, uh, I'm in the game. Um, yeah, I, I often. I think, I think we're both above average. Yeah, your show does better than mine, and for and now, I, for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. I mean, I'm glad we yeah. both want the shows to do well. Um, but what made you decide on podcasting and oh. not just 
blogging or like YouTube or something like that? Why? Right. why well, podcast? you can see what I look like. So YouTube's out. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I I can't help how I look. It's who I am. No, so, I love it. I think you should start a YouTube yeah. channel. So, so forget that. Um, well, we have a YouTube channel and it, all of our podcasts go there. We have some videos up. I, you know, I don't know how right. to edit video. and I, I have friends who are good it's, at that. Let them have that yeah. game. Um, right. We started the podcast because uh, my original partner, Dave Kellum, uh, we started writing a book about the quest to catch and eat every kind of freshwater fish in New Hampshire. And we were writing for a couple of magazines who we, we put out of business with our writing. Um, and that's not, they, they, they both, we, both magazines we wrote for for that year of the quest or three years of the quest um, went out of business while we were writing for them. So we'll, oh, I know. Yeah. Out of all the, all the New Hampshire magazines to go out of business. Yeah, yeah. I know. Um, and we were writing this book. We had a big time agent out of New York City who was trying to sell the book for us. And publishing houses kept coming back to us and saying, you're too New Hampshire. Why would someone in Toronto care about catching all the fish? Oh. And I'm like, maybe you haven't read our pitch. Or maybe, maybe, maybe our um, agent wasn't selling the book well because we we're telling stories. Right. Or, or they don't know any kind of fishing person in general because fishing people will, you know, there's, there's definitely, there's, there's that connection, right? F fishing is all regional. I mean, yeah. any fish story you write is about a place, right. right? And New Hampshire happens to be the, the setting, yeah. but every book has a setting, right? Um, but, you know, we wrote it about- it crosses over the ideas behind it. Like, if you think about the same thing as like craft beer, when yeah. you go to a different place, you want to try their craft beer. You want the local people flavors, that's right. People will come from Toronto and we'll go to New Hampshire to fish or mm -hmm. we'll go to the Yukon to fish. You know, you know, that's where that's what they like to do because it's a different region. Yeah. So um, anyway, all this writing, the, we never sell the book. We've got, I would say, about 78 percent completed, done. Right. Um, right. And writing is hard. And when you're writing yeah. for free, um, which is pretty much what we do, well, you get paid a little bit of money. But if you break it down on a hourly rate, you're making about yeah. 10 cents an hour. Uh, writing's hard. Um, so we thought making a podcast would be easy, right? Now you do this. That's also not true. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, they they say for a one hour podcast, if you don't do a lot of editing, you can expect four hours of editing uh, <laughs> for about yeah. a one hour show. If you're a big editor and we used to, we, we tried doing the NPR edits and that, that took like oh, forever. We did a few shows like that. Um, that took longer, but we made the podcast because we could, we, both of us were very good communicators, very good speakers. Mm -hmm. Um, we used to teach together and we had a good feel for each other and we could do some presentations to like the library organizations and stuff. And we really had a good rapport. So we thought, let's make a podcast. So we yeah. did. And we launched it. And my original headset was just like a cheap, I stole, I stole from my classroom it was a cheap kid's headset with a. A uh, little microphone in front of the mouth, and this t the sound quality was absolutely terrible. And yep. as everybody's <clears throat> first podcast is, yeah. And we sent it out in the world, and we weren't ready for it to be popular. And it got, you know, all the it got featured on on iTunes immediately, and got a bazillion downloads the first week, and then it crashed and burned because everyone listened to it and went, "Oh my god, it's funny!" And we have feedback with this. It's funny, but we, your quality is so terrible. And we're like, oh, yeah, we yeah. peaked too soon, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You almost want that run up a little bit, to, and then figure out the sound, and then go. For it, right? <laughs> yeah, they should. iTunes should never feature a brand new podcast. Give them, give them fifteen episodes, yeah. and then, and then feature them. And by the way, anyone who's listened to a brand new podcast episode one. Uh, and if you find the content good, email the host and say, love your content, buy a good microphone, please. Yeah, yeah, uh, we actually yeah. got that email, and then we went out and bought good microphones. But, <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. after my 12th episode is when I bought this microphone. Yeah, and it matters. Ever since. It yeah. does. And everybody ever since is like, wow, that actually. Now I get, I, I went to the, a conference, and people recognize me by the voice. They're like, yes. oh my God, that's the voice. You do and have a beautiful wow. voice, like a, well, like a canary. <laughs> Stunning. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we make the podcast and then we start getting yeah. feedback and it's that feedback loop. It's the listeners that keep us making it. Um, if, if we never got any feedback at all, no one ever reacted to anything we did, we would have been done a long time ago. Um, yeah. But yeah, I hear you because it's, 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 it's tough to put it out. And then when you don't hear feedback, you're like, is this what people want? And, mm -hmm. and then you look at your statistics and you're like, oh, my God, nobody download, no, don't, don't, nobody download it on a Saturday. Well, they, maybe they don't like my 
Mm-hmm. It's my voice and you get all this paranoia. Yeah, I've been through all that. It's, yeah, it's, I find my listeners prefer when I'm drinking a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so I'm sober right now, just so we're clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're both sober. But I'll tell you what, there is a podcast coming, the Speak Up for Blue Network, that has a happy hour involved. In oh, it. good. Well, we're we have the similar things happening, and we have a, a show coming up soon with another podcast called Great Beer Adventure, where we'll be doing uh, beer drinking, uh, fish fishy beers, so like Sculp and IPAs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we'll be doing hull testing. I think what we'll do that time is get all of our correspondents around the world, including you, if you want to play. To yeah. get their local fish named beer, and we'll do a big beer tasting around the world and do a share that way. It'd be totally fun. That'd, yeah, that'd be so good. So, like. anyway, let's get on with, well, with your topic. To sustainable yeah, let's fishing. Get, let's right? get to, so, so let's start off with you know, we, when, when you contacted me and, and we, we've been talking about having you on the show for a while, mm-hmm. okay, let's talk about sustainable fishing. Uh, you know, I immediately thought about, and, and when we talked about an article uh, f- uh, that Rhett Talbot, a, f- a mutual friend of ours uh, who's been on the show as well, wrote, uh, you know, sustainability. And, and he's, you know, in, in the article, he talks about sustainability it shouldn't be something that should be like elite, elitist, which right. a lot of people think it is. Well, you uh, see it, you, you know, it. I, it's, it's actually, he it makes a very good point in that. And I, and I actually kind of thought that before, before I saw his article, but you think about organic foods, right? Right. I, I hate it. I hate the marketing of organic foods. Yeah. It's my it's my my I won't I don't buy organic foods for what? Because I don't right. like food wrapped in plastic. And for some reason the supermarket, everything organic wrapped oh in plastic. And then the stuff with pesticides is out free in the open. I'm like, well, I'm gonna yeah. buy the stuff with pesticides and wash it off because yeah. I don't like single use plastic. So screw you organic marketers. You guys are dumb. Stop yeah. it. Stop. If they were the truly plastics. organic, they would understand the plastic problem. Because organic is a sales tool, not a quality tool. Exactly. And I think the sooner we realize that, the better. And and I think sustainability can move in that same direction, and that would be a mistake. And I think that's Brett's point, is it ends up becoming just a marketing tool and an elitist thing like, oh, I'm sustainable and you're not, right? Yeah. And it misses the whole point of sustainable fish and fishing. Yeah. Um, when I find too that when you when you go to the supermarket and you actually look at like you know Whole Foods and stuff like that, within it's it just all they need is is one ingredient that has to be organic mm-hmm. to make it you know they can sell it as organic and and in Canada I don't find there's a really good certification program to say that it's actually organic. Yeah, and I'm not convinced it's better for you. <laughs> I think because I think one thing to keep in mind with the organic foods is. Is there is giant factory farms in China producing organic vegetables for us for consumption, right? We're still importing right. this food from around the world. It's still getting pesticides on it, but they're organic pesticides. But chemicals are everything, right? People forget. They go, oh, I don't want chemicals on my food. Well, then don't eat because everything is a chemical, right? Water is yeah. a chemical. But yeah. they, are using, they are using caustic chemicals on organic foods. They have to be organic <laughs> certified pesticides. Yeah. It's still... Which is kind of it's still happening, weird. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, I agree. I yeah. agree. So I, I think uh, so. When we talk about sustainable fish, uh, it, it's really tricky. It's a hard conversation, and it seems to be no solid one answer. Mm-hmm. So when I was at the Virginia Aquarium last week, uh, I got to go well, two weeks ago. Got to go to the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center um, to speak all week to people about sustainable seafood. Now I'm not an expert. Mostly, I went to learn about sustainable right. seafood and the, but you were also invited by the aquarium they invited me oh yeah, yeah. They, they flew me down and put me in a big fancy hotel and it was that, that is, i, I got, wanted to make sure people knew that oh they, man they oh yeah no i was totally their guest i was a celebrity guest for a week that, and you'd love this awesome. because as a total nerd yourself i got the behind the scenes aquarium tour so i got to see how they care for the fish yeah. um i also learned i've been calling fish dumb for years i take it all back uh fish are <laughs> They, they, did you know, this is a kind of a sidebar, but did you know at these big aquariums, they train each fish individually to eat, so they hand feed them all, and that we keep track of all the food they're eating. So if they need to feed a spotted ray, for example, they've yeah. trained them to come to like a purple paddle they put in the water, and that right. each individual spotted ray has their own color they've been trained to, and they hand feed them all. The puffer fish, spotted rays, the barracudas, the sharks, everything is trained this way. And they just can so they can they can monitor their health. They can monitor, or they have, if they or have the to do surgery, or the doctor needs right. to get in there, they come right up to those paddles. It, it's remarkable. That's and I and I also learned about secret aquariums. Like uh, I'm sure you have an aquarium in Toronto. 
Yeah, yeah, the Ripley's. Okay. Yeah, and I bet you about twenty miles away, there's a second, a second super secret aquarium. I've learned about where they, this. Where this they is, keep all this stuff. Yeah, where they keep the backup fish, where the science is done, where the yeah. rescues happen. I learned about that. I got to go to a secret aquarium. I mean, all this really cool stuff. But that I mostly cool. I was there because they have a program called Sensible Seafood. They're trying to educate the public about how to buy seafood, right? So yeah. when you go to the supermarket, my assumption in the supermarket is. They wouldn't sell it to me if it wasn't sustainable, right? Right. And if you ask them, they're going to tell you that. Uh, in my big supermarket here, I live in Mount Washington Valley, New Hampshire, um, in the mountains, maybe an hour from the ocean. Um, there's giant signs. We only serve sustainable seafood here. So now the trick is how does one define sustainable seafood, right? And this is their challenge. Uh, that we all face. And what I've been trying to get people to do is look at four main ingredients here. What makes it think something sustainable for seafood, right? Um, my biggest one, and this is not everyone agrees with me on this. I'm, I'm not right. But my biggest one is, uh, is it local, right? So if yeah. you're near the ocean, if you're on vacation in, in South Carolina, for example, and you're at a restaurant and they're serving you Alaskan crab legs, Maybe you don't want to get that. Maybe you want to eat blue crab, which are caught locally, right? Now, arguably, both populations are strong on both those fish, uh, fish, both those yeah. crabs. Um, yeah. But one is more sustainable than the other because it doesn't travel as much. Now, I'm defining sustainable as the whole process. As the whole process, right? Yeah. It, it, how does it impact yeah. the environment, not just that population of fish? And that's different than a lot of people do it. So, is it local? Is one, right? Um, is it plentiful? Are there lots of that kind of fish? Right, so if they're red listed or if they're right. recommended, you you know even on the yellow list, maybe you want to avoid that species and pick something that's that's not uh, in danger. You know, um, yeah, uh, I don't eat cod anymore, for example, even though they still right. sell at supermarkets, and <coughs> I don't eat cod. I don't, I don't. I like it; it's delicious. Yeah, of um, course, it's delicious. It's, I, I'll eat it's other good. fish in the cod yeah. family, but I won't eat the Atlantic cod uh, anymore right. because I don't believe it's a good idea. Right. Um, and then, uh, and so is it? Is it abundant? That's really important. Um, and then I would ask when it was caught. Is it local? I mean, is it? Is it? Um, is it fresh? Which doesn't necessarily mean it's not sustainable. It's just I like it that way. And then, how was it caught? Yeah. Right. Because if That's you're if you're out there eating blue crab and they're dredging the bottom in the winter where blue crab are hibernating, and they're disrupting the environment, the crab itself totally sustainable because numbers are strong. But you've wrecked oyster beds and all kinds of other things as you were scraping the bottom there. So there's a problem with Absolutely. that. Now, can we expect to serve at a restaurant to know those things? I'll tell you what, though. It's tough. At a good restaurant, you do. You do. At you a, do. At a fancier restaurant where you're paying the big bucks, they usually do. Yeah. Not well, all. They, they they, generally speaking, they do, and that's marketing to um, rich people, right? Right. They are right. To the organic people, the gluten-free people, the whoever. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, 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 it's a bunch true. of rich white it's people. That's, I mean, let's be honest. That's who's, that's, that's what it is, yeah. for sure. For sure. Um, there, there's no poor person on earth who's gluten-free. Um, no. It, <laughs> so, but that's, it's a marketing tool, right? Um, and it's okay. And that's fine. But we can ask one question. And I, this is where I always say, just, just ask one question. Where was that fish from? Basic mm -hmm. question. And that starts the conversation, right? And if they don't know that one thing, then order the pork. That's yeah, the, yeah, exactly. It's the basics. Yeah. Um, I, I don't figure out where yeah. it's from. Exactly. Yeah. If they don't know where it was sourced from. Um, and that's kind of where I push people into doing. Um, I know I'm participating in a program right now called Eating with the Ecosystem, which is a citizen science project. Now, you motivated me to look for a citizen science Atta project. Atta boy. There I, we go. I heard your Love podcast it. on this, and I found one that was happening in New England called Eating with the Ecosystem. And the way it is, is every week, there's 200 of us doing the project. Uh, every week, we get a random email of four sustainable fish that are caught in the Gulf of Maine. Okay. So, And they define it as local, fresh, abundant, right? Um, okay. And they, don't, they didn't mention how it's caught. They just do those three things as far as their definition goes. And that's fine. It's their experiment. Um, and then we have to go to our local market and buy them. Now, I'm five weeks okay. in. I have not one, in five weeks, I've not caught, got one fish on my list. Because they they because they haven't sold it. They don't sell them at at my market. Now they do. And you're an hour away from so the just ocean. In perspective, you're near the Gulf of Maine. You yeah. Know, is it in the Gulf of Maine? It no, is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so you're in the Gulf of Maine, an hour away. Mm-hmm. So that's a you know a short truck truck uh, delivery, mm-hmm. and you haven't been able to find that local. Well, but well, well, let me just clarify. There are probably sixty f- different fish and shellfish on the list, and I'm giving a random slamp of four a week. It doesn't mean the fish in my stores aren't on that list. They're just not on the four I'm given. You know, so like mm-hmm. lobsters on lobster might come up someday on my list. Lobster's always available here, right? Yeah. Um. And you so, know, what ca- can you can, what what kind of fish? Give us an example. So of, here's uh, what I have not been able to find locally yet, right? Okay. I have not been able to find periwinkle. <laughs> I have not okay. found striped bass. Striped bass is caught this time of year with hook and lines, not big netted fish, right? So that's sustainable. I have not found um, I have not found bay cohogs. Hmm. They, they ocean cohogs, according to this, are not sustainable, but bay cohogs are. I found ocean cohogs. Um, I have not found. I mean, this is, gosh, a trigger fish. I've not found. Uh, so is is it is it? It's, it's uh, very specific. The fact that they're not on in season. No, there's or, oh, they're all in they're season. Supposed right to now. be in yeah. season. So that's part of the experiment. That's part of the experiment. Everybody yeah, in season. And yeah. System. They just you just and these are not the ones you you know the ones you mentioned are. Well, I guess maybe striped bass you would expect to be in there. But striped you, bass you expect, but periwinkle you wouldn't expect. Maybe a little bit um, spiny yeah. dogfish is not in the stores. They're not serving spiny dogfish um, in the stores. You can get that. Now, if I drove an hour to the ocean, I would get all these things, but that defeats the but purpose in your area, of the experiment. The whole experiment is in yeah. your area. So, so, by the way, and anyone who's doing these kind of science things, don't try to rig it. Don't right. drive an hour no, and get, no, the, no. get the thing. Just because you say, I got it. You know? Well, because you want to do it. You want to eat the yeah. food, right? But it, it doesn't work if you no. game it, right? So the zeros are more important than the ones. Zeros so are great. That's what we great. always say in science, right? The, zero, the yeah. failure is always more important because that helps dictate the truth. Like it, exactly. It the well, so, and yeah. so, well, this week, actually, today I got my list for this week, and I have any locally caught tuna right now is okay. Which I okay, disagree so with a little bit, right? but yeah, but there, there is that definitely going to be in the store. So I'll be eating tuna this week. Um, hopefully, I'll get a little choice <laughs> from there. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But so it's 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 interesting though. And then at the end, it was twenty five week experiment, which is great. So a lot of data okay. to collect. And what they're trying to do is find out: is it even possible for people to eat sustainable seafood in their area? Right, and if not, why? And who are the gatekeepers? And so what they can do with this data is they can take that data and then they can, um, well, my opinion is shame the businesses who aren't doing the job, you know, like call up the supermarket and say, hey, you got these giant signs all over this store saying sustainable seafood, where two thirds of your seafood is from Alaska or from Australia or Chile or wherever it happened to be. Maybe we're only an hour from the ocean. Yeah. Maybe you should just get the local stuff. Maybe you got to get local stuff, right? But I think- it's also not only just a shame thing. I think it's also a great way to initiate a dialogue. Sure. To be like, how come you're not going local? Well, <laughs> what's the? Is it too expensive? Is it not accessible? Like, do you not have the? Like, is it is it a monopoly from somebody else? I mean, that would be the interesting. That's a that's out. a good question. And the other thing it's going to do is every week I go in and I say, do you have bay coha? Yeah. Do you have this? Now, what's going to happen is one person asking the question changes the market. You don't realize how important your voice is until you use it, right? But one person asking every week, hey, do you have this fish? Or hey, yeah. do you have that fish? Um, the fish buyer, the fish monger, the guy behind the counter wants your business. And right. he's going to say to his boss, hey, boss, why don't we have this fish? Yeah. You know, why aren't we serving spiny dogfish? Yeah. You know, um, and then they'll say, well, is it available? And they'll go, yeah, it's only 15 cents a pound. Oh, let's, let's get it. And rename it Cape yeah. Shark and, then that and what sell that it. Does is because what they're, they're not just going to get one for you. Nope. They're going to get a bunch of them. And then they're going to be like, hey, do you want to try this? Because yeah. we just got in. People have been asking for it. And it's a great way to market. That's I've never thought about that for, for a program like that. That's sure. Actually a good idea. And so I, I think what happens is as I get further in, we'll get more and more positive hits. Um, that's my prediction. Right. I'm not the scientist who wrote the experiment. I am going to invite them on the show for sure. Uh, midway through, I should connect you too because you would love to talk to these guys. Absolutely. They're great. Yeah. Uh, it's called Eating with the Ecosystem. They are a nonprofit out of Rhode Island. They're worth worth dealing with, and they're smart and interesting. Um, yeah. But then it brings us. So you're in Toronto, right? Yep. All right. So sustainable seafood in Toronto is that even a thing? If local is on your list of it's not fresh, <laughs> it's not fresh. So here's the right. problem, right? Do you actually want fresh seafood in Toronto if you want to eat in a sustainable green way? 
Right. What do you think? Well, absolutely. absolutely. Do you want I mean, fresh? I want fresh. Well, okay. I'd rather have, I would rather, now I, I <laughs> don't know. I'm going to challenge you on this. All right. All right. But Go before ahead. we get into that, I, I just want to say, I, I have to plead ignorance in terms of eating local freshwater fish. Mm. Maybe because I'm a marine scientist, um, but I, and I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a fisher person. So, you know, I know some of them and I've had, you know, I've had certain fish that I'm like, Oh, that's good. You know, that's, that, that was good. Um, but like if there's a Marine fish on the menu, I'm like, Oh, I like it. But then I, it, I, I used to like it. Now I'm like, Hmm, hold on a second. Atlantic salmon. That's going to take a while to get in here and it's and, not going to be fresh and it's probably not going to taste as good as, as you know, what, you know, what it should be on the East coast. Cause I've been on the East coast and I've been able to have, you know, mm-hmm. fresh food and cheap fresh seafood. And, uh, and so, so it gets, I get frustrated. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 there are certain restaurants within like my area that we can go to and we know we're getting fresh because they're a seafood place and they have freshwater fish on them. Right. So now it's funny. I in New Hampshire, we're not even allowed to sell freshwater fish. Like this is not a, not a thing. Yeah. No, we don't. Allowed. No. What's the what, what's the reasoning behind? I, I laws. I have no idea. I, I can't tell you why, but we have no. There's no market for freshwater fish in New Hampshire. Wow. Now there was a loophole for a while in Vermont. You're allowed to right. And New Hampshire, we have some abundant numbers of some freshwater fish, like panfish, for example, like uh, bluegills, right. pumpkin seeds. And there was a group from Vermont coming to New Hampshire every day and would take their limit of panfish back to serving restaurants in Vermont because New Hampshire, you can't do that, which I think is, was unfortunate. That the laws have changed since then. No, you can't do that either. Right. Um, so in the Great Lakes, though, I know there are freshwater fish restaurants, freshwater seafood restaurants. And, um, but I'm, I'm, let's just pretend you don't have the Great Lakes. And you want to eat ocean fish, which I would agree with you, arguably tastes better than most freshwater fish. Um, something different about it. I, I'm, people are going to challenge me on this too, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but do in, so if you're living, let's say, how long a drive from, <laughs> from Toronto <laughs> to the nearest ocean? Well, if you, well, okay, so to the St. Lawrence Seaway, mm-hmm. you're probably looking at about four and a half hours to get to the salt part of the same okay place. so if that's not terrible four and a half five hours okay. to get to like montreal area which is uh, it's the estuary part right? okay and and does seafood get delivered into that area or does your seafood for fresh seafood come from all the way on the atlantic ocean it would it would, well i think i have a feeling depending on this on the the fish a lot of it will be coming from farms from f- fish farms okay yeah so let's it, well, I'm, okay i'm gonna rethink this whole conversation so if you were I would argue, like, if you're going to eat seafood that's from a long way away, that you're going to want it frozen and not fresh. Yeah, <laughs> and and because if, I don't think if this will stay, <laughs> well, well, you can dry, you can you can overnight, like flash freeze it. Well, you, you can even overnight fish, like in helicopters and airplanes, all this stuff, um, in in ice slurries, and they will get where they're going and be fresh and yummy and all that things. And all the things. Um, but the problem is, is your carbon footprint now gets bigger, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we're talking sustainable. We're not just talking about yeah, the animal. We're about talking the about the environment. So now you got that, let's say you want to eat a fresh Chinook salmon from Washington State, right? Which are arguably one of the best fish in the world, right? Big giant yeah, king salmon. For sure. So you got you get that flown to a fancy pants restaurant in Toronto, and it gets served to you, and, and you, know, you got your twenty eight ninety nine a pound fish there, right there, right? Delicious. Um, but that one fish now costs more than just the price of the fish because the energy to, to get it to you costs a lot. Yeah. But if a truck is driving from Washington State to Toronto full of frozen fish, it you can move a lot more fish that way with a lot smaller carbon imprint or if it's on a train or something like that. So I think frozen fish, if it's from far away, if it's local, fresh, that's the way to go. But again, the restaurants, basic, simple question, where is this fish from? Um, That will get the conversation enough where you'll know whether or not you should eat or not. You won't always be right, but it does start that conversation. Now I went to a sushi place last night. Um, I did not ask that question. Oh, the sushi place. The kids are hard. The su- I, <laughs> my kid. Okay, my kids love sushi. Me too. And uh, I, of course, I enjoy sushi. But every time we go, I just 
I get this guilty feeling because it's always the same, mm-hmm. right? You'll get snapper. Mm-hmm. Like, so I like sashimi. Yes, me too. We had that snapper, last night. Yep. Salmon. Uh, butterfish. Tuna. Tuna. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the other one? I think that's, and uh, so, sorry, I said snapper, right? You snapper, said snapper, salmon, tuna. I think that's it. Is yeah. that it? Yeah. We had, yeah. Th- I think those are the three that, are, that I usually, that we usually have. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's, and, and of course, there's, you know, the kids will do shrimp tempura and, and, and all that kind of it stuff. It sounds like my meal last night. You just described what I ate. <laughs> it's true. But that's, yeah. but, and that's what we normally see. And, and, and to be honest, you go to a restaurant here, anywhere here in Canada, and you're going to get the same, when it's seafood, you're going to get the same selection, unless it's a specialty seafood shop. Mm-hmm. You're going to get options for lobster, salmon. Uh, and and it, because we're in like Ontario, it's usually Atlantic. Um, every once in a while, it'll be like coho or something like that. Uh, and then you'll get like haddock or halibut, which is it's one or the other. Right. Um, and, and to be honest, to be honest, the people eating it almost never know the difference and don't yeah, care. Um, yeah. They want what they want. I mean, I, I imagine Canadians and Americans are the same in their fish. I don't want fish to taste fishy. I just want oh, yeah, white no. flaky fish. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, the restaurant I was at last night uh, on our sashimi, there was also for the first time I've never seen this before. It was mackerel. It was a sashimi, like Atlantic mackerel. Mackerel. You know what? I think we and that's we, not we, normal. Yeah, that's it's not bait, normal. But it, it was it before. delicious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now, good. what it, what is interesting though, I should say, an exception to the rule in in uh, the Toronto area, uh, because we have that population. We have a very big, uh, very large Indian population, like mm-hmm. East Indian. Population. We have a very large uh, Asian population, uh, especially from China uh, uh, and el- elsewhere in, in Asia. But we also have a very uh, uh, large uh, Caribbean population. So that brings in a lot of other types of fish. So my wife is, is Asian background. Her oh, parents yeah. are from Taiwan and Hong Kong. They love their fish. They love their food. So when we go to the Asian restaurants, you see fish all over the world. Right. And that's a, a fun place to go to. Now, I'm not against importing fish and eating them. I, I just think that but it's, start it's local. Footprint. Yeah. It's a footprint. You know, you're so looking think at the footprint. It. and Yeah. and But, what, you know, what's, what's interesting about uh, the Asian culture, especially because that's probably one that I've, that I've been to more, uh, is they'll eat every part of the fish. They'll eat very bony fish. Sure. Right. Whereas uh, sort of the Western culture tends to be like, that's too much work. Yeah. And uh, so let's let's dig in on that a little bit. So on our show, on the Fish Nerds podcast, we have a culinary correspondent called Hugo. Okay. Uh, He was from the Cape. He is Portuguese. His wife, uh, I'm going to get this wrong. He's going to be pissed off at me. Um, His wife is Asian. I want to say from the Philippines, but um, I could be wrong. But she's from one of those kind of like island nations, right? Who yep. loves their fish. So yes. that between the two, Portuguese depend on their fish. Yeah, yeah they depend sure. on, and they, they and there's no such thing as junk fish. Everything is everything right. is food, right? So Hugo is is like uh, I call him a seagull. He'll eat anything, right? Yeah. But he's always in on the the eat this fish challenge. So he went out uh, fishing last weekend, and he brought home some smooth dogfish. Now smooth dogfish in the Gulf of Maine are shark. Um, mm-hmm. they're not a big shark. They're not like your Makos and that sort of thing. Um, no, they're small. and they're in huge, huge biomass numbers, arguably sustainable mm-hmm. fish, right? They're fast so growers. Far. Yeah. So far. so far. So he brought it home, uh, and he was very proud of eating that over, um, some of the bigger pelagic fish he caught, right? And yep. he shared pictures. I think you probably saw some of the, yeah. the fish and chips he had. Um, and then Rhett Talbot comments, uh, makes makes comments about the mercury content in these fish, right? Right, um, and so that I'm doing tonight, just before the show, I'm doing the research. I'm like, really, because I've been like saying, if you're gonna eat shark, or you're gonna even skip cod, dogfish, dog nice white flaky meat, delicious, right? Yeah. Um, but there's two kinds of dogfish in the Gulf of Maine. There's spiny dogfish. And yep. there's smooth dogfish. Smooth dogfish get a little bigger, um, eat a little higher up in the food chain, and when you eat higher in the food chain, that's you, when the yeah. You aggregate mercury. mercury. But they have uh, about 25% of the population of of smooth dogfish in the Gulf of Maine right now, they're estimating, have mercury content that's much higher than the recommended mercury in anything you should be eating. 
and it's because it aggregates over time. So if you're going to eat the smooth dogfish, you want to eat small ones, not the big ones, right? Um, But spiny dogfish do not have that crazy mercury content. They do have high mercury because everything does, but not crazy and not also above the level the allowable levels right i think it was like on average it was about two percent on average or above the levels as opposed to 25 okay. percent on average wow um Even and then that's a lot it's not that bad um and then the um it's not that bad we, new hampshire i guess if you eat a lot of it though yeah but right? who's eating a lot of it right i yeah, mean it's, i guess and it aggregates over time. And you're not eating, like, Hugo might be. Most of us, if we're going to eat spiny dogfish uh, fish and chips or smooth yeah. dogfish fish and chips, it's one meal a year. It's not going to make any difference. You'd right. have to really consume to make it really have the impact on you. Um, right. Now, I couldn't find a comparison to these fish and other large fish that we're eating. Um, and I, and I, just, I didn't look long enough, probably. I'm sure they, the studies exist. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we've been pushing people to eat dogfish for years instead of eating mm-hmm. um, eating the big sharks or eating cod. Yeah. Um, and here in Canada, just to let you know, here in Canada, they're actually, especially over in BC, uh, and I guess the Atlantic Coast too, they're really looking, uh, Fisheries Ocean is really looking at establishing that as a fishery. like a Oh, sure. Fishery. Well, I mean, right now it's it's a bycatch, and mostly they're thrown yeah. overboard or killed. and. Or they make them in, into dog food or something, you know, something else. But it's it's supposed to be really, really good. Um, I actually haven't had had it yet that I know of. I although I'm told if you've ever traveled to England and had fish and chips, you've eaten dogfish. Oh, okay. Uh, and it tastes like cod. Um, yeah. Which is a nice thing to know. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's good. Like, well, you said it's 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 uh, it's a good taste. Mm-hmm. You know, people like good taste. Um, I I don't know if people would love. Because of the fact that they are a small shark, I don't know if people would love, like you call it spiny dogfish, and that's okay because people are like, oh, spiny dogfish. Yeah. That's not a shark. I'm okay. But with everything that's going on with sharks right now, if you hear shark, a lot of people are against the fishery and establishing the fishery. Sure. Uh, and understandably you know, so, right? Will come out and say, this is actually a shark. We should be very careful with this. We don't know that much about them. Right. And that, that's the argument. I will, I will accept that argument. Um, well, listen, we're going to eat fish and we have to kind of decide which ones we're going to eat, right? Yeah. So the, either way, they're going to get eaten, right? Fish are going to be thin. Right. So then we look at like um, on the, our Facebook group tonight, Ryan Dubé posted this giant like diatribe about why we're not seeing things like sea robin and sculpin and weird fish in restaurants. I don't know if you read it or not, but... I read it. It was a great post. But but basically, it's saying is like, yeah, totally true. All delicious fish you can eat. But uh, can we bring it to market? They're small fish. They're bony fish. They've got weird spikes all over them. They're tough to to, to fillet. They're tough to process. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you pick up like a large cod, it feels like a big piece of meat. You can just slice a fillet off that thing like it's nothing and you're at the market. So so there's an efficiency issue, right? And I think it's a fair point. we, again, we don't have the answers. <laughs> We're going to yeah. keep asking more and more questions and try to make the best choices we can, sure. right? But if you know a fish is endangered, don't eat it. Yeah. Uh, and if you know it's if it's in question, don't if you, if you spend money on a fish that you know is questionable, then you're supporting wiping out that species. Yeah. Right. If you know it's questionable, if you don't know yeah. it's okay, it's going to happen. You're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And don't feel bad if you make a mistake. It's going to happen. But next time, don't do it again, right? Right, right. Um, so you you choose the future of our fish with your dollar when you buy seafood. And my vote for you is do some homework, choose fish that are sustainable, and pay your money to companies who are who are putting that fish in front of you. Yeah. Um, but then it gets confusing, too, because what about fish farms? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, here's a question. Before we get into that, I have a question for you talking about endangered species yeah. and so forth. I just came back from the Cayman Islands. All right, good. I talked about this last week. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard this episode or not, but uh, so at the Cayman, have you been to the Cayman, Grand Cayman? No, I'm not rich podcast from Canada. I can't afford <laughs> to travel like that. I did not. I did not pay for this trip. I guarantee that. Oh, you um, got I, funded when your sponsors funded. took you down. Yeah, my yeah. parents uh, uh-huh. uh, sponsored the podcast. I need new parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we went, so we, there's this one place they call it the, sea, the Grand Cayman Sea Turtle Center. Uh, great place. You walk in, very educational. They, uh, they have a breeding pond, uh, which is basically full of green sea turtles. They have the beach behind. And you call it breeding. In. I call it orgy. One of us yeah, is more orgy. fun than the yeah, other. That's, it's an orgy. that's actually the first comment we made. If it's you like, wonder oh. where the party is, it's not at Andrew's house. No, it's not. It's <laughs> not a great dude. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's a good one. Um, 
so anyway, so it's it, very educational. You can you can see the different stages. You can actually snort. They have a lagoon where you can snorkel with the turtles, not touch them, but snorkel with the turtles. There's even like a touch area. They they circulate. Anyway, I'm not. I see if there's a lot of people going through a, a sea turtle center like that. When they touch, it's it could be a bad thing when they get cruises come in and everything like that. But to go into it's also a fish farm. Or or a, and what they do is Grand Cayman has a history for sea turtles. So loggerheads, uh, green sea turtles. I don't know what there was a third one, I don't remember the species. Uh, they were known to like as a stopover to have sea turtles. So they would either poach the eggs or they would have the meat of the sea turtle. So Grand like the, the Caymans that live there are all used to eating sea turtles. Like in terms of generations, um, so this this center basically says the way they they say it is we fund the center part of the center through ticket sales, but we also fund part of it through selling sea turtle meat from the farmed sea turtles, not from the wild, but from the farmed sea turtles to the restaurants because we know that the, the local population will want to eat sea turtles. We're trying to take the pressure off the wild populations, and we actually contribute to the wild populations by releasing baby sea turtles to the to the ocean. But we also sell sea turtles to the restaurant, sea turtle meat. Now this is, a, and this is where conservation gets complicated. It's always been complicated, right? It always yeah. gets complicated. But this is one of those situations where you can take either side, and I feel from from my perspective, you have a good point. Sure. From one side, this city turtle center is saying we're taking the pressure off the wild populations, which are all endangered. All the all the species, seven species of sea turtles, are endangered around the world. We're taking the the pressure off the wild populations by supplying the meat from here, a certain percentage of the meat that we or that we raise of the sea turtles that we raise. Um, but on the other hand, it's like why don't you take those sea turtles that you raise and release them, right, and contribute to more of that population. Right, but you said they were doing that. Well, they are, but they're only doing a proportion. Like, right, so you but take but you know, like that. in the wild, only a small proportion of sea turtles of a big giant clutch. What two make it to adulthood? Right, so so but you're increasing those odds maybe by doing it. That's yeah. the argument. That's a fair argument. That's the argument yeah. with a lot of people would say. Right, yeah, is why you know why kill them because they're endangered. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you know, it, and and it's but it's it's a it, and from my understanding, it's a staple. I don't know if it's still a staple. The we went to a number of restaurants. We only saw it on the menu once. Right. And you didn't buy it. My brother bought it. Well, because really aren't you me. curious though? Aren't you, or did you taste He's it? Curious. He said it tasted like chicken. Bullshit. That, that, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> tastes yeah. like sea turtle. <laughs> but he said, it, he just said it didn't really taste like anything different or anything that he would get again. Well, I mean, that's the, um, the, the basic fact of the matter is, is culture sometimes sucks. And yeah. if you, I think culture is the worst reason to keep doing stuff that's mm. wrong. Um, I, I hate the argument that we do it because it's culture. Um, I, it doesn't hold. We we had slaves yeah. at one point, right, in this country. That was part of our culture. Does not make yeah, it okay. True. True. Um, we murdered all the buffaloes. That didn't make it okay because it's part of our culture. Culture sucks at conservation. We need to fight against our nature. And human nature is not conservation, by the way. Human yeah. nature is consumption. Um, right. We need to fight that. Conservation is all about, I think going against our our norms and our culture it's almost it's it's kind of like a little punk rock almost it's like you know screw you yeah. i'm not eating that screw fish you. yeah man. yeah <laughs> yeah you know what it's 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 uh, by the way i just pictured you with the mohawk it's fantastic um <laughs> <laughs> Any, anytime you picture me with hair it's a win <laughs> i didn't wear this hat because like, the hat looks good <laughs> that's awesome yeah. but you know it's it's, it's funny because it's it's uh it's something that I've been thinking about for a while too, especially when you're it's coming to eating any kind of seafood is and we've been it's sort of been the underlying theme to this is we can't have everything. No. You gotta we have you to gotta realize make that as a human population that we can't have everything or everything. Mm-hmm. We can't you know, physically we can. Like if we want fish, like if we if I want grouper and I live in Toronto, there is a restaurant that will probably serve grouper. Look, if you got money, you can have things. Right. Right. <laughs> you can have it. But is it ethically right as as someone who wants to take care of the earth or the ocean or both is it really right we have to understand that we have to have limits right right we can't have any fish we want at any time mm-hmm. because it doesn't make sense from 
a climate change perspective. And uh, like you said, that whole process, that whole process to get that fish onto your plate is a huge carbon footprint. Sure. And we need to realize that from uh, from just managing our lives a little bit better, that local is better. If you want something mm-hmm. different, go to a different place. When you're on vacation, then partake in local. Then food. eat turtles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, when it comes to endangered species, don't eat turtles. And I told my brother, I'm like, don't eat turtles. Damn it. It's in their danger. Yeah, you paid um, money to make it keep happening. That's what you we did. We did have an argument because of it, I have yeah. to admit. But uh, we're brothers and that's what we do. Uh, but, um, you know, I think it, it's it's we need to realize that there's there's limits to what we can have and, there's, and 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 partake in. Right. And I and I think that once we start realizing that, you know, and once we start showing that publicly and accepting that, that's when you know we're going to start to change things, right? And I, and I feel that um, without without doing that, we're just going business as usual. I I swear to God, when I was in Grand Cayman on, on the menu, I saw salmon, Pacific mm-hmm. salmon, mm-hmm. and I went, "Why yeah, would right. I come to Grand Cayman to eat Pacific salmon?" Because uh, it, because you're a North American. Right. And as a North that's, American, that's, that's, that's our, the fish. That's our thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's our go-to. Yep. Right. Salmon but cod. That's like, it. it. Doesn't make sense. And and yeah, and cod was on the menu too. And I said, look, why would I come all the way from the north to the south to eat northern fish? It mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. I and I asked them, and it's to be honest, it's the same thing. And going back to craft beer, I asked them, what's your local beer? What's your local beer? And what's your local fish? Because I want to. Have, and what's the? Best? And I actually asked. I said, what's the best to pair? Perfect. Right? And they See? said, oh. And they were they were good that way, but they but know it's, their beers. <laughs> important, yeah, it's important because, and I think like looking at that and asking them one, it's great because when you go to a different place, you really get into the culture, um, and you know about the culture. But it's also you're eating locally, you're helping the local uh, economy, and plus you're some trying something new, which is kind of a treat. And I think we need to realize that those treats mean, you know, some good things not only from the environment, but for us as well It's like every once in a while, Oh yeah. Okay. If I want to go and have, you know, Mahi Mahi or, or, you know, yellow snapper or red summer, I need to go to a place where they, they, you know, they get it locally. Cause you know, especially those small islands, you're normally getting it from an artisanal, you know, fishing community yeah. where they're not, you know, grabbing it all at once. You know, they're, they're doing it sustainably. Hopefully that's what you expect. That's what you hope. Now, what do you think about farm raised fish? Things like tilapia, pen raised Atlantic salmon in the ocean, uh, inland fish, fish farms, um, trout farms. I, I was at the, the, uh, sensible seafood festival and there were people there serving farm tilapia and farmed rainbow trout. Um, I, now I was a sole judge of what's sustainable. I got to be the one who chose the winner for that whole, I was the only judge. It was my, my decision and I eliminated any fish that was from far away, uh, and anything that had a lot of packaging involved with it. So that I chose the winner based on like, there's no napkin, there's no plastic cup, there's no spork needed. It's just food in my hand. Right. That was, it was only about five of those available. But, um, so what about farm fish? And this is something I don't know about, like, um, a lot of a lot of reputable food distributors and sensible food and sustainable food programs recommend some farmed fish. Um, I, I, you know what? If we if we go by I think the it's part of the mix, right? Yeah, it's definitely part of the mix. And to and and there's the argument that farm fish will really be there to supply the world with food eventually because the population is just getting so big that we can't sustain wild fishing all this time. That's right. One of the arguments of farm fish. It's a fair um, argument. It's a definitely a fair argument. Uh, when you look at it from our definition of sustainable as an entire process, if I'm getting farm fish from the Atlantic and coming to Toronto, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. As getting, you know, in terms of getting wild, yes, you're taking some pressure off the wild stocks, but there's there's inherent problems in open pen ocean farming. Well, it, you see that. I don't know if you've been to Puget, Puget Sound at all. But they've got yeah. Atlantic salmon pens out there. I've kayaked out next to them, and 
they're full of big salmon and seals yep. tear holes in them and then the Absolutely. salmon get out and they start to breed in the waters where the Chinook spawn and that's problematic, right? Well, and there was there was a study that came out saying that the, a disease that was gen, that was uh, brought in through the open pen system got into the the wild population, the Pacific population, and that's what decreased. That's the, was one of the biggest biggest hits uh, when a couple of years ago when we saw a big dip in the amount of uh, coho salmon coming back. Sure, yeah, yeah. not to mention the course, dams are still the biggest impact. Right? Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's other there's other problems as yeah. well. But turns out humans problem. are the big impact problem here. With for all sure, these things. for sure. Um, and, and I mean, yeah. when you're looking at um, you know not only are humans relying on coho salmon. And, uh, the First Nations groups relying on coho salmon, but you're also looking at a resident orca population that is endangered that only eats salmon. Ah, oh, let's shoot them. <laughs> yeah. uh, this but it's is, true. This and, is and, where and, we're going with some of these conversations you know, tonight. This I is, know. We're heading that's, there. So it is. Uh, it's, it's true. Uh, um, the fishermen and, and are funny so about things. <laughs> It's true. It's well. I mean, look at look at the when we discuss the gray seal uh, on my show and and and, and your show, um, people are like, why can't we just call them? Well, right. we're we're having that conversation this week on the Fish Nerds page. I brought it into it from another fishing page where people are talking about wanting to go out and shoot the cormorants out in the Great Lakes and at Lake Champlain because they're eating all the stocked fish. Right. And I'm like, they're eating stocked fish. Um, stop stocking all this fish. Just yeah. for something else. Um, but then yeah. you get this cultural problem going on, and I don't know the answer, but um, early and research. There are, there are programs, like government programs, yeah. that try and, and um, uh, I guess, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. Manage. Um, <laughs> in, or trying to just make it difficult for comrades to settle. Yeah. You know, we have actually, believe it or not, right beside the building that I work at, the government building, we have three islands that were made as fish uh, my or not fish uh, bird migration stopovers uh, and they're they're run over by com- comrades and uh, they have a program where they get birds of prey trained birds of prey to chase them off interesting and uh, now you want they to don't do it anymore but they used to do it now com- comrades were near extinct in the 1970s because of DDT right so you want to talk conservation when comrades are back win. right total yep. win same and, with the great seal population yeah. in Cod, right? right same and of and, course, and, and sorry, and the same thing with the great whites in uh, in uh, California. People absolutely. right now are freaking out that there's so many great whites, juvenile great whites. It's great that are all on the coast of uh, that are all along the coast of, of California. I remember talking um, to uh, Chris Lowe out the, out in Long Beach, and he was like, "Yeah, this is a huge win because of the different regulation tools that we put into place, saving the the, the sea lions and that you know." cascades into protecting an endangered species mm-hmm. and bringing them back from the brink. These are conservation wins, but when it comes to interfering with human activities, yeah. you know, fishing, surfing, paddleboarding, scuba diving, sure. whatever, swimming, uh, then people start to, you know, certain people start to get annoyed and right. say, we need to bring back a hunt. We need to control them when we shouldn't well, be controlling the population. It, it, we should be truly controlling ourselves. Well, here's the hard part, right? Let's pretend, and I'm a fishing guide, so I, I hear this, um, argument i'm a fishing guide on lake champlain and i'm catching less salmon this year than i've caught in the last five years meanwhile i'm watching cormorants eat salmon by the hundreds Mm -hmm. that's what they're saying that's what the report reporting to me uh of course my livelihood is is at stake this is what i went to school for i've invested all my life savings in this i am not changing careers now i'm a 43 year old gnarly fisher guy right? <laughs> right 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 what do i do now i got to i got to do something right so i contact the local government agency and i say hey what's happened with these cormorants and they say they're protected uh and they're only about 20% of their diet is uh is your salmon and trout and the rest is herring and you know whatever else am i happy with that answer cuz my what i'm seeing is different than what is being reported to me. And that's what we're facing right now is yeah. the observation of the fishermen doesn't match the science. And yeah. how do we get those to, those guys all together to figure that out? Well, and that, and that's where it comes when you, when you look at conservation is when you bring stakeholders together, mm-hmm. government needs to speak to stakeholders and vice versa. It has to be, when you talk about, it doesn't matter whether it's a lake, it doesn't matter whether it's an ocean, you, you have that communication going. What it used to be like is it used to be each department in, in, in government used to be manage a different, uh, say, human activity, right? So let's talk about big ocean. You're looking at 
you know, one we had for, for Canada, we had the energy to board managing oil and gas leases. You had fisheries and oceans managing, um, well, they would manage the, the oil and gas because they manage the bottom, but they'd also manage fisheries. You have uh, Parks Canada putting in parks. And, and so all the different, uh, and Environment Canada managing different aspects, uh, j- but they weren't allowed to do water. They were only allowed to do land. Um, so when the birds go out to water, it's something different. It's it's just, it was, it was so jumbled. And it wasn't until we brought in the Oceans Act, and it's still not clear that we bring everybody together. To, so that we can put in marine protected areas and we can do ocean planning. Right. And that matters. That, really, it, that matters because right now it's the wild, wild west out mm-hmm. on the water because everybody's been allowed to do whatever they want. And that includes big companies, that includes commercial fishing, uh, fishing communities, recreational fishing communities. Really, we haven't really managed them in a certain way. And they haven't, there haven't been zones like we have on land, right? Every city, every county, every region, every province, every state have everything divided up, all land divided up into, you know, something that's protected, something that's zoned for business, residents, uh, you know, parks, whatever. We don't have that in the ocean yet. Certain parts do, but we don't have it in the ocean. Now it happened out in BC recently. And it was a, it was a, it was a weird thing that went on because at first it was the federal agencies were really driving this program. They had the, the uh, BC government, the provincial government, and they also had the First Nations tribes. So there's a lot of First Nations tribes on the West Coast, just like there is on the on the the, the U.S. side or the U.S. Uh, uh, part. They were involved. Everybody was involved. Then all of a sudden, we you know conservatives in, in charge, and they're like, "No, we're pulling out because we want a pipeline to go through." So we're pulling out the federal departments, the province, and the the First Nations kept that going. Now they have an entire plan for every human activity in the ocean for the BC coast. They have that plan. And now that we have a more environmentally friendly government in, now they're trying to bring the, the feds back and say, okay, now what, you know, based on, you know, feds handle oil and gas and fisheries. Now, how does that plan, you know, get more involved? It gets more complex, but there's still more stakeholder meetings, but that's what we need to do. We need to divide up the ocean in terms of the economic zone that we have exclusive economic zone. And we need to plan it out. And that goes with fisheries. That goes with uh, fish farms. That goes with recreational activities. Uh, it, it goes with boating. It goes with shipping lanes, especially. Um, all that matters. And then you've got the environment, like the, the natural environment that needs to be protected. And that should go happen in lakes. It should happen in the Great Lakes. It should happen in Lake Champlain. It should happen everywhere. And then the science and the policies and the management initiatives should be shared amongst everybody. Well, and, and communicate in a way that's understandable. The the other thing that I think go right along with what you're saying is is government needs to move faster and be more be <laughs> able to like respond to people in a way where they feel like they're being heard. Because these guys complaining, yeah. I guarantee you that their people they're talking to in, in the government are hearing them, and it takes a long time. It's it's like steering a train. You can do it. You got to kiss them, move those tracks along. It, it takes a long time to do it. Absolutely. Um, but people aren't feeling like they're being heard. And yep. and then they, they vote against their own best interest because they feel like no one's hearing them because things aren't happening fast. Right. Um, and that's not how government works. Government is a process, right? It takes it, time. It's a process. Well, it's also and, any indication. And I've seen it because I work within the government. Every communication that goes out has to be reviewed and has to be perfect because if they say anything that looks wrong or that looks different, people are going to call them out on it. So they have to be a No, really? <laughs> a government going to be called out when right. they're wrong? Yeah. Good yeah. thing they're never wrong. Uh, yeah, it's That's... good thing they're never wrong. <laughs> um, but it, especially when it comes to science yeah. you know, and, well, and policy, when you're dealing with human activities, it's like you're you're essentially controlling or trying to regulate people's livelihoods yeah and that's the and hardest that part gets, gets you. that's the hardest I mean, especially that, from a like a dying industry like an industry that you know you're getting less fish for yeah. com- say commercial fisheries so they're looking for f- they're looking for food you're getting into a changing environment and now you got to change your policies right and, right. and, it, and it's so easy to, for us who who don't make our living on a fishing boat to right. to decide what people should be doing yeah. Um, but I mean, the, basically, it's if it's all. I, I mean, I honestly, I think ec- economics is going to drive everything eventually, for sure. And we need to look at that. And by the way, I, I there's a great book. If you, it's a few years old now, probably twenty years old now, but it's called The Ecology of Commerce. Have you ever read this book? 
No, I don't. I've heard of it. I haven't. So it's it's a classic um, looking at at using economics to drive good ecology, right? Right. Um, One of the premises in the book is you tax waste. Right. So in order to eliminate waste, single use plastic, this is twenty years ago. um, You would. You would okay, sure. You want to buy that single use water bottle? It's going to cost you a dollar extra. Yeah. Or you can fill up for free over at the sink over there. You know, yeah. like it's it's taxing things. You so you choose whether or not you want to pay that thing, and that money goes to conservation and to cleaning the environment and taking care of those problems. So maybe you want to have like uh, a a sustainable fish uh, re, re, tax relief program or something. So if you choose to eat sustainably. Uh, and they define it have to they really work hard that definition, but um, so you're eating, you know, you're eating the bait fish as opposed to the big pelagic, uh, big roaming fish. Maybe those are cheaper, not just because there's less market for them, but because we're going to levy a tax on the big game fish because mm-hmm. that's what um, we're ruining. And we yeah. and the government spending millions and millions, billions of dollars trying to get these fish back. Meanwhile, we're depleting them at a faster rate than they can mm-hmm. recover. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm just throwing ideas here. These are not no, my policy things. I just yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I hear uh, you. We're just I, talking, I, but but we need to be more creative in our answers, for sure. and for sure. we need to find a way to let the economy drive it. Because to be honest, people like conservation, but people like money more. And yeah. it, and if it's cheaper, they're going to do it. And so when they're shopping yeah. for their fish, um, they're going to shop. Uh, most people can't afford to buy, you know, Patagonian toothfish at twenty three dollars a pound or whatever it is. I um, mean, Chilean sea bass. Yeah, although they don't <laughs> get it in Chile anymore. Now it's caught off the coast of Australia. It's not Chilean right. sea bass. It's a different kind of toothfish. Yeah. Um, but that's that's a whole other. That's, that's a whole other. We could do it. I would love to to do to get an expert on fish names on and do a whole hour on on fish oh, names yeah. because they rename fish in markets so much. It's so um, crazy. But 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 maybe we need to think about more creative uh, answers and. And um, when Definitely. when gas prices were going up, a market for efficient cars existed. Now gas yeah. prices in the U.S. have dropped. SUVs are back. The, yeah. it, the people. It, it goes on the for sure. It's, it it's got to be money. Be it's got to cost more money to to be a terrible person. That would be the yeah. solution. <laughs> when it, and here's it like here's going to a basic example. We're talking a lot about North America here because that's what we know. Yeah. Um, well, but there's, there's no other story. part of the world. Oh, of course. <laughs> We're it, but man. It, you know, <laughs> one of the stories that always captures me, especially when you're looking at the fishing community, a great way to end the show is because uh, it makes it so complex, is in Indonesia, they created a uh, shark sanctuary, so a protected area for sharks, because what happens off this coast, there was a huge uh, finning practice, so a shark finning practice. Mm-hmm. And the reason why there's such a shark finning practice is because when it came about, because of the price of the fins were so high for the fishermen, the fishing community, the people, in the, the families in the fishing community could afford to pay for their kids to go to school without finning and just regular fishing. They, their kids couldn't afford to go to school. Well, then I, if I was those people, I would fin. Right. I would, it's, you and, have and, no and choice. You're stuck. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and, and but they're vilified in the media because there's no you know all they hear is like they're finning they're finning and this is not like necessarily like a, a bad part on each side it's just the way it works but then when they brought in the sanctuary the people who put in the sanctuary spoke to the 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 fishing community and they said hold on a second let's figure out a way that we can keep that lifestyle going and put in the shark to protect the sharks uh, put in the sanctuary so what they did is they ended up teaching them how to get involved in the tourism the shark tourism industry. So oh, shark yeah. diving this. So they became boat operators and they were paid a salary and they were still able. Now I'm not sure. I'm not sure if everybody in the fishing community were able to do this, but this is the story that came out saying some of them were able to become boaters and they had a salary and they worked for a company and they worked, you know, more in a more positive form, you know, more sustainable form. Sure. Um, and they were able to send their kids to, to think, cause if to school, if they, if they weren't able to, I'm not sure this would have worked. And I think that's what we need, really need to do is we really, need, and when I talk about, you know, talking to the communities, we really need to put in training. As another example, that's not fishing related. You look at Alberta, you know, in can here in Canada. Yeah. Now um, I'm just making a clarification here. Um, I'm in the United States, um, Alberta. We don't know where that is. <laughs> okay. Alberta. <laughs> is it fair? 
Alvarez and the Praise, this is the Tar Sands, home of the Tar Sands. All right. right? We all know about the Tar Sands. Um, it's, it, it neighbors British Columbia. It's almost on the coast. Not quite. Calgary, right. Edmonton, great hockey teams. That's all you need to know. And great CFL football teams. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody in that, arguably a lot of, most of the people in that province are working in the Tar Sands or have something to do with, with uh, the Tar Sands um, industry. Now, because of a new, because of politics, because of OPEC putting down prices, our economy has dropped because we, our previous government put all our resources in building future pipelines and getting tar sands out to markets out the Asian markets. It didn't go well. Prices went down. It costs a lot to get extract oil out of the tar sands. These people are out of work and they are angry. And you would be too. Well, of course, because they're out of work. Uh, and it's expensive to live in Alberta because the prices shot up. Like, right. Because metric right? money. Of course. Yeah. Right. Um, so now we're in a we're in a stance where they want to go back to work because that's what they know how to do. And they know the tar sands industry. The government is, is, is doing a little bit of both, but they should be training. In my opinion, they should be training these these engineers who are very smart. They, they know their stuff. Engineers, uh, the, the oil sands workers to be going into renewable energy because that's where the future is going to be. Sure. Right. We all know oil and gas is, is going to be gone. Coal is already starting. Coal is forever. (laughs) Apparently. I'm aware. (laughs) Apparently (laughs) it's kind of going through a resurgence. Yeah. Um, But in all honesty, even the coal, even the coal industry is like, we're not going to be around. for much. We don't want to be around. We don't want to be around. (laughs) Yeah. And so, but we all know that the 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 renewable is going to be hard. So these people should be trained or should be training to go into the renewable or should be higher because they already have the. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest; they already have the skill set to do it. They just need a little training to to get into it. So, the whole point of this of this argument is talk to the people who are involved who are going to be affected because it's it's not the ocean that we have to manage; it's the people that we have to manage. Absolutely. Well, and, there's 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 another approach too entirely. Which we don't like talking about, right? Um, but I listened to another podcast, you know, Freakonomics podcast. Love Freakonomics. And yeah. they did a whole thing on what if we just gave people money rather than funding programs? So mm-hmm. rather than funding all these cool. all these job training, whatever, you know, you're paying other people to show people how to work, all these people who need to be retrained and they're old and they're stuck in their ways. Why don't we just pay you a salary the rest of your life and you stop doing that horrible thing? And then that's one generation and we're done. And we move on. And I bet you if the math, according to the Freakonomics, it actually is cheaper just to pay people than to run the programs. And people know what to do with their own money. They was, know, that the, was that the conclusion of that? They, of that people episode. know how to spend their own money when what's best for them. And we don't. Right. So all these programs, which are expensive to run, you got to have management, you got to have buildings, you need You're infrastructure. You have to do this. Yep. If, you, know, you jump through hoops, and we'll give you a percentage of the amount of money we're going to actually spend on the program. Why don't we just give them the money and not manage it and say, here's, okay, so you make $40,000 a year as a coal miner. It's all you're ever going to make. Uh, here's so here's, here's 40,000 40, a year until your pension. And then, mm-hmm. and then the coal mine's dead and we move on. Um, yeah. And we build colleges and we train people to make solar panels or whatever it is. Or but we that pay would fishermen require not education. to fish. Or we that would pay... require investing in education. And that governments aren't involved in that. Yeah, no. They don't, they don't want to get it's, <laughs> it's coming. It's look, things are changing, it's gonna be okay. Um and just kind of just to just to kind of recap things though, where I am I am a fisherman. I do make part of my living on the water as a fishing guide. I do eat fish. Um, on our show, we have a uh, boat captain called Captain Sean Tibbetts, who runs Miss Megan 2 out of Maine, maintunafishing.com, and I've been shark fishing with him. And I've caught and eaten a Mako shark. Um, before I did that, I asked Maine Fish and Wildlife, is this a safe fish to eat? Am I doing the right thing? And I, so we did it. Um, and then I went on public radio the next day. And all hell, you know the. Oh yeah, people aren't gonna like you. They didn't like me, and they were right. Um, I was wrong to to do that, but at the time, I checked in with the local resources and and didn't realize I was wrong. People are gonna make mistakes. My yeah. biggest regret. But why? Why did they like you said you talked to the government, look like the state government? Yeah. And they said it was okay. Well, because in the Gulf of Maine, Mako shark numbers are strong. There are tons of them. They're they're everywhere. Um, 
And so they have really, really huge numbers in the Gulf of Maine. There are a lot of mako sharks, but um, they are large fish that swim across the world. <laughs> and so they are not... Just because fish are huge in numbers in one area doesn't make them big everywhere. And that's what we didn't catch on to. And regulations are done state by state um, for fisheries. And so and there are some national... Federal, there's federal laws too, but like a lot of this is state by state. So Maine regulations said... Right. Totally okay. Yeah. And so I trusted those people and, and maybe maybe I was wrong to do that. My biggest regret is not killing and eating that shark. Um, it was delicious. My kids ate it. We fed about 20 families. I, t- I, bought, I paid a bar tab with a piece of the shark. Um, it's not eating the fence because mm. I I didn't think about it. But now I'm like, I, I want to know what the, uh, I, I don't want to ever, I'm never going to pay for shark fin soup, but don't you want to know what's so special? <laughs> like if you had a chance, because you did, were there anyway, the fish was already dead. I didn't use the whole fish. I used everything except for the fins. Um, right. Maybe I should have had shark fin soup. I don't know. Like <laughs> we're going to get blowback on this now. But it's, uh, no, no, no. You know, I mean, it's what? real it's, life and it, it happens. But there's a, know? there's, there's a difference. <clears throat> and, and, and a lot of people have arguments with this, but there's a difference when there's a shark fishery that's established. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between finning, where you're just going for the fin and throwing the shark back, mm-hmm. to eating the entire the shark. The entire shark, right. Which, by the way, I, that's my thing with shark finning is, is there's a lot of things with it. But um, People shark, aren't going to like us for this, but I- Shark but, is delicious. <laughs> it's so good. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and I think you, but when you look at it, like you look at the whole sustainability, you look at what's happening with every shark, and we know very little bit, very little about sharks in general- uh, when you look at the overall sort of stats, but we know how much they're declining. Mm-hmm. That would prevent me from eating shark. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm uh, done with it now. Just on respect. Yeah, 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 no, for yeah, sure. I've, I've but learned, I, but you I know. To make, I want to make it clear that if somebody buys a shark or catches a shark and buys a shark legally, uh, there's a difference with, you know, trying to eat the entire shark and then just compared to just chopping off the fins and throwing the shark back a lot. There's that barbaric aspect, but it's also the waste aspect. Oh, absolutely. Of higher fish. So I wouldn't necessarily feel guilty in that, in that respect. Um, I'll be honest. I, there is a story that I have, um, you know, where I was at a, a banquet with my in-laws. Uh, it was a banquet dinner and uh, shark fin soup was served. It was the first time I've ever seen it. I knew about the problems that with shark fins. Uh, it was probably the worst uh, hour that I saw this come out because there were a lot of people there. Um, and the people that were eating it at my table were just easy. And I, of course I refused it. I actually had to get up, leave the room. Oh, it's upsetting. Uh, and just because it was so upsetting. Um, but what was nice, what came out of that, um, my father-in-law understood that he was not involved in, in the organizing. Um, but that was a regular occurrence at banquet. Dinner. It was a wedding. Um, but after when we would go to banquet dinners and he was in charge of the menu, uh, or my mother-in-law and, and father-in-law were in charge of the menu, they would X the shark fin soup because they knew about the repercussions. Right? We've talked about it. They knew how upset I would be. So they would take it off. That is a win for me. Yeah, totally. Right? And, and, it, yeah. And, it's a, and it goes to show that I have, uh, you know, they have a lot of respect for me. Uh, and the environment, because that's you know that's what they know. So well, it all comes uh, down to you do. It's one person at a time. It's one fish at a time. It's one. It's communicating, and exactly. and we're gonna get it wrong, and we're gonna yeah, get it wrong gonna a lot. Time. And, yeah, for and sure. yeah, for sure, yeah, for sure. And and you know, Captain Sean, who goes out, he makes his living on the ocean. He's doing everything legally. Yeah, um, and he's gonna make his living right. Yeah. Um and and we'll and I'm gonna be going fishing with him, but we're not going out for. Makos. Makos. Uh, we actually we weren't targeting Makos that day. We were supposed to catch blue sharks. It was a catch and release trip, but um, we we're it's a long story. But we got into it. <laughs> yeah, but you got into it. And I think yeah. I've heard that story before. Yeah. And, but I, but uh, you know, like you said, um, there's there, we learn from our mistakes. Uh, I make mistakes on the show quite often. Actually, that's how I met Rhett Talbot. There's yeah. a mistake that I well, made. Rhett will tell you uh, every mistake you make. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's not I think shy. It's I think it's part of the science communications. I'm not perfect. Uh, we're not perfect, but we're getting information out there and we admit our mistakes. And I think that's important. Uh, that transparency is important in a podcast. We see it in mine. We see it in yours. Uh, and to be honest, I think that's really why so many people engage us uh, on, on, in our groups, uh, through the podcast, through email. 
yeah. however through social media because we're so open about it and we're not afraid to admit our mistakes and it's mm-hmm. it's not easy it sucks when you make a mistake but uh yeah, we, we, that's how we, we practice we, making mistakes around we here. practice <laughs> all the time but i'll tell you clay i just want to thank you for coming on the show this has been awesome this is obviously going to be first of many times oh, any time yeah uh, because it was it was a really interesting con- conversation uh sustainable fishing is, is difficult uh to to get a hold yeah. of but i think the definition that you uh, proposed today in terms of the overall process mm-hmm. and easy for us to think about that. Right, so let's recap it. It's, is it local? Is it abundant? Um, is it fished well safely? Um, and is it fresh? Uh, so it means in season is what fresh means. Right. So those right. are your four factors, but if it's traveling a long way, get it frozen. That's kind of the fifth kind of sidebar. Absolutely. Um, but Absolutely. that's it. Simple, but really just talk to people. Where was this fish caught? That's the only question you have to ask at most restaurants to get everything you need. Yeah. So. Yeah, and if they don't know, go for the pork. Pork is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Clay. I really appreciate it, guys. Go to uh, fishnerds. Doc- it's fishnerds.com, right? Sure, everything's fishnerds, yeah. Fishnerds.com. Go to iTunes, download the podcast. I think you're on all the other apps and stitcher we are the we are the second easiest podcast to find the easiest one to speak up for the blue there we go yeah (laughs) (laughs) i love it i love it but no thank you very much we'll put all the links uh to the group as well you guys can join the fish nerds group uh join our group we cross pollinate all the time it's going to be awesome Mm -hmm. Uh, but thank you very much clay for joining us i really appreciate it. anytime thanks wonderful all right. Well, hey, thanks, Andrew, and always fun to have him on the show. What did you think of that? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, it's the- <laughs> He's full of information. Yeah, the guy knows his stuff. He so. really does. Yeah, in fact, the week after that, he had a guy on who is an ocean economist looking at the economy of sustainable f- seafood. So a whole different like money approach. If, you're, if money is your driver and not yep. the environment, you'll hear about that on his show. So it's, it's worth your time. You know, oftentimes that's a way to get people onto the environmental causes through the financial aspect well, There's no of it. downside to having a good environment. No. It's good financially, it's good for the environment, and everyone wins. So. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's it. You've listened to a whole bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. <laughs> thanks to Hugo. Thanks to Andrew Lewin. Thanks to you, Nick. <laughs> oh, glad to yeah. be here. Always a blast. Always fun. So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spun early and often. Right. Um, avoid free lunches with strings attached. And swim against the current. Every chance you get. Oh, and now it's time for your local fishing reports. Hi, this is Steve from the North Country Angler, North Conway, New Hampshire. This week, the fishing in the Mount Washington Valley has been great. The fish are biting on flies in all of the major rivers and ponds. The best fly has been the red quill followed by the yellow sally and then the tan caddis but if you want to try something different use a little brook trout little rainbow trout or a little brown trout bucktail thanks for listening and you can find me at the north country angler facebook page tight lines everybody hey fish nerds captain sean here from maintunafishing.com uh the bass fishing's on fire right now spent had about two hours on the water this morning and averaged a fish almost every cast. Uh, should get better. Bigger fish start showing up here. Uh, some 40s. And rumors of a few 50s kicking around. Uh, the majority of the striped bass are 18 to 25 inches. Still a good time. Uh, the offshore fishing is pretty good. I expect to get better over the next week or so as bigger bodies of pollock move in the uh, codfish are thick 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 it's tough to keep getting away from them but we've managed to get it done uh shark fishing probably start heating up here in the next week or so with these pollock showing up I expect to see some uh bigger poor beagles kicking around keep an eye on my facebook page maintunafishing.com we'll be running open boat charters once a week uh pretty decent price for a 10 hour day on a charter boat with only a four other people uh stay fishy my friends